Thank you for joining me for what is really being communicated, recognising incongruencies in clinical interactions. My name is Sharon Goulbert. I'm a Quest Institute trained cognitive hypnotherapist. I mainly work with adults between their 20s and 80s with differing types of persisting pain. Some who've been experiencing pain for many decades or much of their life and others maybe a year or so. I've got a special interest in persistent pelvic pain, initially through my own journey, uh, 10 years at its worst, and the past 10 years as a clinician. I'm a trustee of the Vulval Pain Society, host of the VPS webinars and VPS conference. Whilst I'm not talking about pelvic pain today, I want you to bear in mind that pelvic pain is very common. One in seven women and one in 10 men in their lifetime. These are conservative figures. The reality is pelvic pain may be a great more prevalent. Many of the examples I use today are going to be from patients on various genders experiencing pelvic pain. So vulvodynia, various types of vulval pain, perineal pain, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, prostatitis, testicular pain, penile pain. And with what we're talking about today, this adds an extra element of taboo, which might mean people don't talk as openly about what's going on in their internal world. So let's get started with this quote. One cannot not communicate. Humans, we're pretty good at communicating. If you watch two friends having a conversation who've known each other a while, you might notice a kind of matching and mirroring going on, whether that's particular phrases they might have in common or particular mannerisms, gestures, facial expressions. And when we get on with people, we tend to do this unconsciously, automatically. We like to belong. We like to belong to a tribe. And we're pretty good at picking up automatically on nonverbal cues or nonverbal behaviours. But could it be that we can fall into that trap of making assumptions just because one person has a particular expression on their face might mean one thing to them, but the same expression on someone else's face may mean something different. Now, as I'm getting started now, I've got some thoughts floating about uh, this wonderful stage, San Diego Pain Summit. Thank you, Rajan, for inviting me. And the incredible people I'm sharing this stage with over the years and this year, incredible scientists, educators, clinicians. And as I reflect on that, there may be a touch of imposter syndrome sneaking in for me. Um, you might even notice that I'm maybe looking a little bit hot in the face, maybe a, a colour change. Perhaps you can see my face flushed a little bit. Um, and actually, now that I'm talking about it, I'm starting to feel a little bit cold. <laughs> so maybe there's a colour difference there. Or maybe you can't really see in the lighting. Or you might be thinking, well, I don't really know Sharon that well. Maybe this is what she usually looks like. And so there's something important for us to do with our patients. And that is to calibrate. But I'm jumping ahead here. Freeze. In this moment, completely freeze 
and check in with yourself. Your facial expression, the muscles in your face, what are they like? Any tension there? Your body, your shoulders, what's your body saying? If I could see you, what might I see? What might I perceive? Not what is actual or true for you, this isn't mind reading, but what might someone else perceive? When you're with a patient, know that in every moment, even when you're not speaking, and sometimes even more so, you are communicating. So calibrate. Calibrate yourself. Now, many of us may be working online at the moment, and this can be an opportunity to see the expression on our own face. I've certainly caught myself um, pulling strange faces, uh, perhaps looking a little bit too serious, or perhaps with a smile on my face, which is actually a little bit inappropriate at times. So one cannot not communicate. And for us to also know that we are bound to make mistakes. And there are all kinds of quotes about making mistakes. And I've adapted one. One who never made a mistake, never made a discovery. So should we think of certain things as mistakes? I mentioned imposter syndrome earlier. And look, none of us are perfect. We can't get things right all of the time. But ultimately, the most important thing is that we have the intention to do the best we can. And absolutely, learn from our mistakes. Evaluate our own performance. And that includes perhaps after an appointment or at some point, evaluating what have I communicated through my facial expressions? What might I have communicated via my body language, my voice tone? Was the volume I spoke at appropriate? or the pace that I used, were the metaphors that I used appropriate for the person in front of me. This evaluation isn't about blaming ourselves, but it is about bettering ourselves and the clinical care that we give. So is it a mistake or is it a mistake? A mistake means we have an awareness of what we've done, that we don't beat ourselves up and instead use it as an opportunity to learn, for us to improve the next time, the next take. And I used to use an evaluation form years and years ago um, when I got started. And I would hand it to the patient at the end of a session so that they could reflect upon any needs that were met, whether their needs were met, any needs that weren't met. And it was really eye-opening for me, this evaluation. And it wasn't about getting 10 out of 10. This isn't about ego. It was far more interesting to see those times where perhaps I might have scored a nine or an eight or even a seven. And what that was about to explore that. And so there were opportunities to learn in that evaluation. So... Let's think about emotional expressions. How good are we at reading them? 
What are we seeing here? Happiness, anger, excitement, frustration, surprise, naughtiness. How accurate are we at reading these? How about this emoji? What are we seeing here? Happy emoji, right? But here's the thing. In certain cultures, this emoji might mean disbelief or distrust. It might mean irony. That someone's being patronizing or passive aggressive. If we can't even agree on the meaning of an emoji, how can we agree on reading an emotional expression? Or is it emotional expression? These facial configurations, these facial movements, are not reliable indicators of emotion. Instead, we'd do better to calibrate the individual person in front of us. And there may be differences between cultures, socioeconomic factors, developmental factors, perhaps the mood, perhaps someone's just tired. A yawn might mean that they're not bored, but actually unable to stay awake because of sleep issues, just a possibility, or might mean something else. And context matters, different nonverbal cues and nonverbal behaviours in different contexts. So it might differ between a GP or primary care setting where appointments are every 10 minutes, or very short, or a gynaecology clinic where there might be other implications or possibilities to a physio appointment or a pain clinic where the journey may have been far longer. So that environment we're in can be so important. And how about reading nonverbal behaviours? How good are we at this? If someone has their arms crossed, does this mean they have this closed body language? Or they're fed up? Perhaps they're just cold. And how about if someone is tapping their foot? Might it mean that they're anxious, impatient, or there's deception going on? Perhaps they've just got a tune in their head. Sometimes it might be obvious what's being communicated. And other times, not so obvious. But we could probably do well not to assume. I had someone come in who was hunched over. There was no eye contact. And I used GAD7 and PHQ9, and she scored high on, on those outcome measures. And her depression levels seemed to be very high. But it wasn't just about that as we explored. There was shame there because she was coming in for pelvic pain and she wondered why it was that she had that. Was it down to something she'd done? So often things are more complex if we dive a little bit deeper. So can we read those nonverbal behaviours? Well, many nonverbal behaviours don't have a fixed meaning. Instead, we need to interpret them in the light of other verbal behaviours and other nonverbal cues, and also those context and social factors. If we assume we know what a particular look or gesture means, what might we be missing out upon? So how can we discover more? Well, you know, just as there's a difference between hearing and 
listening. And listening not only to the person's story, their narrative, but also their voice tone, volume, the pace. And that difference between seeing and really watching, really tuning in, including those nonverbal behaviors, nonverbal cues. And perhaps even the breathing rate, noticing that. Ways in which to discover more. And if you do see a nonverbal behavior or cue, what might you do? So again, this isn't about us assuming anything. There is an opportunity here to discover more. Whether in an obvious way where you draw attention or another way of exploring that. You might find your own way of doing that. To explore that person's inner world, what might be at an unconscious level. They may not even be aware they're doing and often they're not just below the surface of awareness, helping them explore that further, drawing that awareness. And perhaps just asking the question, what's that about? And so let's have a look at some of my mistakes an opportunity to learn with Libby and she was smiling while she was talking to me and unconsciously I was smiling too and she asked me why are you smiling she seemed kind of hurt by it perplexed perhaps and I was doing it unconsciously I'd been drawn into her story but I wasn't really seeing the bigger picture of what was being communicated. There was a real mismatch there. She was smiling, but her tone of voice didn't match the smile. There was an incongruency there. And actually what was happening underneath the surface for her was There was a a distaste and a distrust in herself. It goes back to that emoji. It's it's not really a smile to everyone. And it really wasn't a smile for her. And in that moment, rapport was broken. It's another mistake. Where I had an opportunity to learn. This is where the patient had their eyes closed and were going through a particular process internally. I could see they were thinking. And I thought I'd given them sufficient time to, to think. But everyone needs a differing amount of time. And I started talking and I saw this quick flash of something on her face. And yet I continued And that evaluation form I was talking about earlier, when the patient filled it out, mentioned, oh, actually, you interrupted my my thought process there a bit. And so I learned this importance of space, of silence. So what are we communicating? Some of the information that physicians convey to their patients can inadvertently amplify patient symptoms and become a source of heightened somatic distress. How about this? I was told at the pain management clinic that there was no cure and that I would never work again. In these instances, 
if the clinician had been watching, I wonder what they might have seen on that patient's face. Luckily, this patient relocated and the new clinician took an interest in their values and the patient is doing what he loves and is happier. Brilliant. Here's another mistake, not one of mine. A clinician at a pain clinic told the patient, you'll have to live with your pain. It's like riding a bike, it will stay with you. He used this metaphor of riding a bike with someone who hadn't been able to ride his bike because of his pelvic pain. Really? That was the metaphor they used? And is this the message they really wanted to communicate? The effort it took the patient to even reach this point, appointment after appointment, and, you know, the taboo, the fears, the possible implications of pelvic pain, the predictive processing, can you imagine? So in that clinical encounter, what the patient perceived the clinician to be communicating held weight. The patient didn't remember anything else from that long pain clinic appointment. He recalls there might have been some pain science, maybe something useful, but the only thing he took away was this, that you'll have to live with your pain. It's like riding a bike. It will stay with you. A young man with his life ahead of him. I wonder, again, what his face might have revealed. So let's be careful with the metaphors that we use. That patient went away and believed he'd never be able to have a sex life again, never have a family. By the time he saw me, his anxiety was the overriding problem. And there was a fear of more damage, a hypervigilance, and so much anxiety. So what's your patient really communicating? It was a patient who was smiling, telling me he was a happy person. And yet every time he told me how happy he was, how content he was with life, how lucky he was, he just did this little shrug of the shoulder. It was really slight. And so I drew his attention to it. And through drawing his attention and giving him the space to have a reflection of what that might be about. We made a discovery together. That he'd been wearing a mask throughout his life. He'd actually just been living this pretense and living his life for others, living his life for his parents, his wife, for work. And that shrug was what was underneath the mask. And that was the anger he'd been bottling up for decades. So let's have a look at key points. Calibrate yourself. Be aware of your own nonverbal behaviours. What might you be sending out? Calibrate your patient when Receiving nonverbal cues, don't assume. Instead, draw their attention to it and explore together if you can. And pay attention. Watch and listen for those possible mismatches between verbal and nonverbal behaviors and cues. And finally, explore and grow. Evaluate yourself when you can and use missed 
takes as opportunities to learn. I hope I've got you thinking about what's really being communicated so that you might become aware of incongruencies in yourself and in your patients. I've been Sharon Goulbert. Feel free to connect with me on Twitter and you'll find me in other places too. Thank you for watching.